Sure. So he was at Blizzard, and if you saw the bio that I sent out, he worked on StarCraft and WarCraft and several other uh, games as well on the cin cinematic side um, as a cinematics director. So I'm going to turn this over to him, and he can talk more about what he's done over the, the many years he's been in the industry, and hopefully give you some uh, tips on what to do to help you get into industry as well. Hi. 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 Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I have one prop I need. Does anybody have a piece of paper? White paper or a line? A receipt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so first question is, how many people uh, looked at my profile on LinkedIn? How many people have a profile on LinkedIn? Oh, I just made it like four years ago. I got one piece of Okay. Yeah. Mind you, the only notable reference is my dad, but hey. We'll come back to LinkedIn later. So, um, uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I, th there's like three parts to what I'm going to talk about. There's, there's a little bit about me and what I've done. There's, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of the state of the industry and what's going on, and where things are headed a little bit, and then um, talk about some things to think about as you potentially um, try to enter the workforce in game development. Um, <clears throat> so, me, I'm going to probably sound really old when I talk about stuff because it's, it's mind-blowing how much technology has changed in just in my lifetime or even since I was 10 years old and it's just it's really unbelievable and it's sort of in context with what I'm going to try to talk about. So when I'm a kid growing up, <coughs> there's no PCs, there's no cell phones, there's no mobile phones, there's no VHS, there's no home movies, there's, no, there's none of that. There's the movies, there's uh, broadcast television, which is three channels usually. And if you're lucky, you live somewhere that had UHF channels and you had to dial it in and maybe it would look okay. Um, and there were books and there were comic books and, you know, and that was pretty much it, magazines. Um, so as a kid, I was really into movies. Uh, my dad was into movies and he kind of passed it on to me. And uh, I have a, um, five kids in my family and, and I have a brother who's about two years younger than me. And we were both really into movies, and that's all we did. And I was really into monster movies. Old universal horror, horror movies like Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, any of that stuff I was a sucker for. Um, anything that had monsters in it, uh, if it had makeup effects in it, if it had special effects in it, I was crazy for it. If it, if it could suck and I didn't care because it had monsters and special effects in it. Um, I really loved King Kong, the old King Kong. Uh, and one of my heroes to this day is Ray Harryhausen, Anybody know who Ray Harryhausen is? I've heard of yes. him Yeah. He was one of the pioneers in, in visual effects and in character animation. Um, he was a stop motion animator and he started on King Kong, working under a guy named Willis O'Brien, and then he had a long career up until the 80s as a stop motion animator and effects guy. Um, and everything in, in, in computer animation traces back to those guys, particularly Ray Harryhausen. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm into. And uh, I was an artistic kid. I drew, I built models, I did all the geeky kid things. And, um, and, and this all happened around the same time. Something happened in 1977, who can guess? Come on. Star Wars came out, right. So Star Wars blew my mind. Uh, I think I was 12 or 13. Not only was it uh, this big science fiction movie, but it took me to this place that I believed existed. Um, I, even though I knew it didn't, but I believed it while I was watching the movie. And it was full of special effects and visual effects. Um, around the same time, uh, Atari 2600 came out. So now I've got this going on. I'm playing computer games. We've got the movies going on. I spent, I was one of the kids that saw Star Wars over and over and over again. And one of the reasons I went so many times was I wanted to f figure out the effects work in it. And um, then, a, you know, the sort of the golden age of those kind of movies, you have got Raiders and Empire and Jedi and all that stuff's coming out, and there was this resurgence of, of special effects-laden movies, and that was my thing. I loved it. There's a magazine called Cinefix. Has anybody heard of it? It's kind of a trade magazine for special effects. I bought the first copy when I was 12, and I have a, I've had a subscription ever since. Um, and I used to dive into that and 
that's what I that's what I loved. Then games came along, and that was my other thing. So I had computer games, and I had movies and comic books and that sort of stuff. Um, when I was about 16, I got a, um, I got lucky. I got a job. I got like a part-time job at a video production company, and they were really good to me. They basically let me do everything. They taught me camera work. They taught me cameras. They taught me editing, and then and they let me do it all. And so from that point onward, I would always do freelance work on video productions and some film productions because I would work basically for free um, just to be on set and do the work. And occasionally I got paid, and occasionally I got to do something a little more creative. Um, when it was time to go to college, uh, I wanted to go to film school. But USC, UCLA, um, there weren't as many film programs as there are now. Uh, they were pretty much out of my reach financially. And so I went to the University of Kansas. And again, I wanted to major in film, but the film program there uh, pretty much focused on history, didn't have a lot of production. But I did it anyway. I saw all, I took all the film history classes. And then I majored in a whole bunch of different things. At, at one time or another, I was an English major, I was a creative writing major, I was a history major, I was an art design major. Um, eventually, somebody said, you got to get out of here. And so uh, I looked at all the credits and figured out that I could probably get a design degree from the, the art uh, department. And that's what I did. So I, I had a BFA in design. Um, while, I was in, while I was in college, I continued to do video production. Um, I worked for the public relations office. And we did all the PR uh, videos for the college. And I worked for the local news station. I was a cameraman and an editor for, for TV news. And one thing that was, I was sure of when I got out was I didn't want to work in TV news. So I, <laughs> I graduated. And, um, and during that whole time, you know, I played video games. There was uh, Nintendo. I mean, there was uh, uh, Atari 2600. Then there was ColecoVision. And then there was, uh, then there was a LOL. And then there was Nintendo and Super Nintendo. And, um, so uh, I graduate, and I can't find a job and really what I want to do. And you know, entry into the f film industry, it's just, I, it, it, you know, I, it's not this linear thing. You don't just apply. And so I wasn't sure how to do that. So I moved to Chicago, and I decided I was going to get a graduate degree in film production. And I wanted to go to Columbia College in Chicago. So I moved to Chicago and hung out. And I went to Columbia, and I just showed up, and I met the faculty and I talked to everybody and they said, you can get in here, no problem. Here's how much it costs. I'm like, too expensive. So I, uh, I got to work for a while. So I stayed in Chicago, I worked, I was still doing freelance work, production work on the side and trying to save up money for grad school. And um, uh, then the recession hit in the early 90s, freelance jobs just dried up, there was nothing there. So I'm in Chicago, I'm working at a job I don't like I'm not going to get to go to grad school for a long time now. I had this money sitting aside. I did what any sane person would do. I took the money and bought a computer. Um, computers had just really, home PCs were fairly new. Um, and I told everybody I wanted to buy it because I was doing a lot of writing and I needed it to, to write my screenplays and stuff, which was partially true. But the real reason was that there was a software company, uh, I mean a software store by my apartment. It was next to the video rental store that I was always hanging out at. And I would go in there and look at software, and this is the early 90s, and I'd see these computer games, and they were way better than the, the console games, and I really wanted to play those games. So that's really why I bought, it. I bought this computer. And when I, when I bought it, the guy, I remember you had an option to upgrade the memory, and I took the option, and I upgraded the memory all the way to two megabytes. <laughs> yeah, it was huge, and the guy, the guy said, what are you going to do, rocket science? And... <laughs> So, but I had I'd gone to the store and looked at what some of the requirements were for the games, and so I, I bought as much computer as I could. I think it had a, I think it had a 20 meg hard drive or something like that. Um, so this is during the this is early 90s. This is the golden age of LucasArts. So this is Monkey Island, Monkey Island 2, Maniac Mansion, um, Day of the Tentacle. If you haven't played these games, you need to. Um, these are seminal seminal um, releases in the game industry. Um, and that, I just sucked me in, that's what I did. And what I also started doing was, I found out about ray tracing on computers. Does anybody know what ray tracing is at all? Ray tracing is a rendering method, and that used to be one of the ways to render images, and it's extremely slow, it's extremely accurate, and it's horribly, horribly detailed. And back then, this is before Windows, so this was a DOS machine. You had to like, 
plot out your scene and understand XYZ space and type in all the coordinates and then you had to figure out what the material properties were for surfaces and where this ray was going to come from and it was stupid. But I did it. And, and you type it all up in this text file and then you would load it into this renderer and then you know, your black and white screen would sit there for three days or a week and then it would say done, and you'd call the image up, and shit, it was wrong, and you'd have to start over again. <laughs> and, um, but I loved that, and that's, I, so I would work, and I'd come home, and I'd do that. And uh, meanwhile, you know, I'm reading about special effects, and CG's just starting in the effects industry a little bit, but everybody was using these SGI boxes that, uh, they were a company that made this really high-end hardware that eventually became obsolete, and it was, they were $100,000, these things, and the software was like, you know, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, the average human could never touch it. So um, one day I had this magazine. And it was a video production thing, and they had they reviewed stuff in the back. And there was a re there was a review of this piece of software coming out called Three D Studio. And I, I blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. There's a three D application on a PC that will do all the things I've been trying to do with this stupid text files. And it's all there. It's got a graphic interface. It's got a modeler. It's got an animation system. It had a material editor that you could see. I mean, it just blew my mind. And it was like $5,000. And that might as well have been $50,000 at the time. Because I'd, all the money I had, I pretty much blew on this computer. So um, I did what most people of my generation did at the time. I acquired a P, the 3D Studio. I got a pirate copy. And that's what you did. And um, back then, there was these. You know, this is before the internet, there were these bulletin board systems that you could join, and I got a copy, and it had no manual, and it's an extremely complicated piece of software, but I wanted to learn it, and that's what I did. And I would, I would come home, and I would spend all my waking hours trying to figure out this software package, and I did it. And um, during this time, I got a job offer to move back to Kansas City and work for college in a video production department, and I took it, and um, I would do that during the day, and now I'd go home and... and build things and light them and, you know, understand materials and understand animation. And um, uh, eventually, I decided that's, that's really where I wanted to be, was this whole CG thing. And that was the culmination of all the stuff that I was a kid with movies and directing and, and imagery and art and, and uh, special effects. And so I took out a loan. I got an even better computer and I bought a legitimate copy of 3D Studio. And I started doing little jobs on the side. It was flying logos and boring things, but I was doing the work. And eventually I met somebody in town who had the same interests as me. And after a lot of talk, we decided to start a company. So we quit our jobs and we started getting work. And uh, it was boring work, um, but it was CG work. And through a lot of being at the right place at the right time and, being, and meeting the right people in the right place, we ended up meeting someone in Hollywood um, uh, who had, was one of the original guys at ILM and he'd broken off and opened his own studio and he was doing all optical effects and 2D stuff. He was friends with the director Paul Verhoeven who was working on this movie called Starship Troopers and they were <laughs> unhappy with what was going on, some stuff going on at Sony Imageworks so they went to this guy's name Peter Coran, they went to Peter and said, uh, hey, you want to take on some of these shots? And he did nothing, he had knew nothing about computers so he said yes. And then he got off the phone and he called us and said, can you guys do this? And we said, yes. And so we, we started working and we found ourselves on the phone with this producer from Starship Troopers. And a week later, they started currying these um, hard drives filled with digitized frames from the movie to us. And we got five shots in the, in the movie. And it was just me and another guy. And in Imageworks, there was like 20 guys working on the shots and it was just two of us. And we should have been panicked, but we were so excited because we, we didn't know how we were going to do some of this stuff. There was no compositing software on a PC. Um, so we had to use Photoshop, and we had to write scripts to load in all the images and do layer work on it and then spit out the new images. And it would, you know, we'd have to set up, and you'd set up the script, and you'd run it, and you'd come back the next day, and you screwed something up. And it was, but we did it, and we did all the shots. And I thought, this is where we're going. This is where I want to go. I've got to get out of Kansas City, I California. And... Uh, this is it. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm still playing games. Um, we'd also developed some plugins for 3D Studio um, to make some money as well that we were selling. And we had clients all over the world, and there were some clients in 
the film industry, there were clients in the game industry. The game industry was starting to transition to 3D. They were still sprite-based games, but they were starting to use 3D software to make some of the um, some of the assets, and then they were still turning them into sprites, but they were just starting to use it. One of my clients was Blizzard, and um, uh, so the 3D art director would call me all the time to try and figure out 3D Studio and to figure out these plugins, and I was helping them out. And um, I went to SIGGRAPH, met a bunch of people, and I got a job offer from this little startup, Effects House, that was going to be PC-based called Blur Studios. And um, that's it. I'm on my way to California. I'm going to go work at Blur. And then and I found out later, I don't know whether this was a coincidence or whether the founder of Blur, one of the founders of Blur, his brother was a 3D art director at Blizzard. And I don't know whether he told him or I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden the guy that was a 3D art director at Blizzard calls me up and says, hey, do you ever work in games? I said, absolutely, but I'm doing all this CG stuff. And he said, well, we're starting to get into that, and we can really use your help. Do you want to come out and check out Blizzard? So I flew out there. Blizzard was like 30 people, and I walked in the door, and like everybody I met was me. It was, it was like I was home. And, uh, and I decided I didn't want to work in special effects. This was it. I was going to do games. And I started Blizzard. And um, within about three months, uh, this guy's name is Dwayne Snett. Dwayne and uh, Matt Sammy and I started the cinematics department. And we just came up with the idea. And we went to Alan Adhan, who was the president, and said, Alan, we want to make a department that just does game cinematics. And he said, OK, do it. And that's what we did. And so there went. You know, nine years almost of work at Blizzard and doing cinematics. Um, so, StarCraft, StarCraft Brood War, Diablo 2, Diablo 2's expansion, Warcraft 3, Frozen Throne, um, World of Warcraft, The Burning Crusade. I mean, I, I worked on cinematics for all those games, direct a lot of them. There were also two projects that I worked on StarCraft Ghost, which never came out, and um, Diablo 3, which we were working on in 2000. <laughs> Um, that I was directing <laughs> cinematics for. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah. StarCraft Ghost was headed, it, it was just, you know, it was a death march. The, it, StarCraft Ghost was started at the beginning of the life cycle of the Xbox, and the, the production of that game was so bad that it, the, it, the development cycle outlived the, the life cycle of the original Xbox. I mean, you, they announced the 360, it was going to come out, there was no way that the Ghost was going to ship. Um, and I'd spent two years plus working on that, and I was really involved in that game. I worked with Chris Metzl on a story, and I was involved in all sorts of level of that game. Same thing with D3. We really wanted the Cinemax to really tightly integrated into the story, so there was a lot of work involved in that. And then um, in the summer of uh, 2005, Blizzard just shut down Blizzard North and put Diablo 3 on the shelf. So now I had like four and a half years of work that was never coming out. And I didn't know what to do. Well, some other guys, work, World of Warcraft had just come out. It really hadn't hit yet. That was a long, very difficult development process. It took a lot out of everybody. Everybody was tired. And um, some other guys at Blizzard said, let's start a game company. And I said, OK. And so we left, and we started this company called Red 5 Studios. And um, uh, we had nothing. And we left. And amazingly, we were able to raise a lot of money. And um, we got a publishing contract with a Korean company, and we got $18.5 million in venture capital funding, and then we found out how hard it is to start a game studio and, um, and hire a team and build a game and all that stuff. And we opened a studio in Shanghai, and, uh, but eventually we figured it out, but we spent a lot of money. So we did a vertical slice, we had a demo, it was killer. Um, we uh, needed a, a US publisher, so we met with all the U.S. publishers, blew them all away. Everything's falling into place. By getting close to the summer of uh, 2005 and, uh, or no, I'm sorry, 2009, and EA and Sony are just fighting over us. And we think, we got it. Like they're, they're courting us. Please sign with EA. Please sign with Sony. And then summer of 2009, the economy bottoms out. Banks close. People are saying it's going to be a depression. And we went from being wined and dined by EA and Sony to nobody taking our calls. And by the fall, they both said, we can't do this. We just can't do it. Shareholders won't, don't want us to spend this kind of money anymore. Sorry. So the company was, we were toast. We were running out of money. And that happened. And so in the 
winter of 2010, myself and all the founders except for one, the majority of the creative staff and the art team that we built, and we all left. And they continued on. One of the founders sort of resurrected it, got some money from the Chinese investor, and they're going in a different direction and they're pursuing their thing. So, took some time off, hung out with my kids, um, spent a lot of time with my kids, and trying to figure out what to do next. I talked to a lot of different studios. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I'm in the backyard. My cell phone rings. It's a Massachusetts number. I don't recognize it, but I answer it. This guy says, hi, my name's Kurt Schilling, and I'm starting a game company, and I want you to be a part of it. I said, what? Mm -hmm. That Kurt Schilling? Like, I'm not even a baseball person, but I knew his name. So we talked, and he called me a bunch of times. I said, I don't want to move to the East Coast, and you know, the history of celebrity-driven studios are that's horrible. Um, you know, they'd say they're working on MMO. I don't want to work on MMOs. I mean, uh, eventually he convinced me to go out. I, I made the team. The project actually looks good. They had a lot of cool ideas. And really it was a team. There was amazing people on this team. Amazing amount of talent. Um, I quizzed them on money. I quizzed them on everything. They gave me all the right answers, so I said yes. And, and all my friends in California laughed at me. But I did it. And so I was cinematics director. And I spent two years, I built a cinematics team, and we had to come up with, I only had, I had really no time to do, they wanted CG and all this stuff, no time for that. I had to come up with like a new way to do the kind of cinematics they wanted. Um, and then of course, uh, and then they convinced me to move there, move to Rhode Island, they, they took this ill-fated deal with Rhode Island money and convinced me to move out there. It all seemed great. And I got there, and about three months after I got there, and I said the whole time, like, I don't, I don't want to be an executive. Don't make, I, I'm not interested in any of that anymore. I just want to do creative work. I moved out there, and within a couple months, they said, we want you to be vice president. And I said, no, I don't want to be a vice president. I don't want to do that. And finally, they said, look, we don't have anybody at the high level that understands games. And then it was like, what? And from that point on, like, <laughs> it just started to smell bad. It just got worse and worse as the year went on. And then, it, you know, there was this, thermonuclear explosion in downtown Rhode Island in April, May, and that was that. It was done. So, uh, so then I'm, now I'm in Peoria, and so that's, that's my short history. Um, uh, so now, that leads into what's the state of the game industry now? Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, there's a lot of, there's, the whole industry is in flux. A lot of stuff going on. There's been more Studio closures, more layoffs than, than ever before. Um, it's a lot of instability. And it all really traces back to the way games are being made and the process behind it has changed in a lot of ways. Um, studios, the big publishers, did not really see this coming. They did not, they, they completely discounted the viability of this as a gaming platform. Of this as a gaming platform. They really did. They saw this as a secondary market to support their big games, and they didn't pay any attention to it. Digital distribution, same thing. Valve started Steam, and they pretty much own digital distribution now. And now the studio's like, oh my god, we have to do that. EA's got Origin, they've got a long way to go, and they missed the boat. So they're scrambling. And they, so they doubled down, and they made games bigger and more expensive, and they flopped. And it all culminated with Star Wars Old Republic, and they, they haven't come out and said it, but, but then the industry, we all know, they, they spent close to $300 million on that game. Damn. Never getting it back. Um, John Riccatello, who knows who John Riccatello is? Okay, John Riccatello was president of EA. He pretty much bet his job on it. They cut him in March. Um, so the industry doesn't know what to do right now. They, they, Big games, big budgets, more failures than successes. Um, to give you an idea about budgets, so in 2000, the average budget of a game was a million dollars. Games were still pretty much sprite-based, but you didn't need a huge team. I mean, when I got to Blizzard, there was only 30 people there, and it didn't really start getting big until uh, WoW started getting developed. Um, by 2010, the average budget for a, a AAA game was $20 million plus. Today it's 25 to 30 million. So, 
Who can make that? Well, nobody can do that. You have to go to a publisher. Publishers control the majority of development. It's a publisher-driven model. So if you want to make a game, first of all, you've got to have some street cred so they trust you and all that. And you have an idea, they'll give you some seed money to do a demo. Even a demo will run you five, seven million dollars. And if they like it, they give you a deal, they'll fund the whole production, and then they take most of the money. Um, if you're lucky and you get a hit and you do a sequel, you can negotiate some better terms so you can get some money, but you know, you hear about all these games that make these tons of money and people get rich. That really is a minority. Studios, the big studios, they make all the money. Well, now there's this thing. And the, the industry has almost come full circle to its old days. Now, I mean, if you want to open a studio like we found out, right, it takes millions of dollars. You, you, to make those games, you're talking a minimum of 25, 30 people. They all have to make a salary. They all have to have health insurance. They all have to have hardware. You need a network. You need a big network because everybody has to share files and have access to files. You need a lot of storage. All this just adds up, adds up, adds up. Who has that money? Well, the studios have the money. Now, with the availability of tools is never like never before. I mean, for a small fee, you can get access to all of Adobe's suite for next to nothing. You don't even have to buy it. You just pay a subscription fee. Um, and then I know you guys know about the Unity engine. I mean, prior to that, you had to make your own engine. At Red 5, we made our own engine. Um, it, 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 you, there was the Unreal engine, but you know, their whole deal is based around you have to pay them profits, and it's not a good thing. And then, um, or else you can just license it outright, and depending on the day and if they like you, it's between seven hundred fifty and thousand and a million dollars to license the Unreal Engine. Um, Unity, you're all in for about five thousand dollars, and you can make a game. One guy can make a game in his house, um, and people are doing it, and they're making you know. Again, people aren't becoming millionaires. There's always a story of it. But people are making a living off the Apple Store, uh, Xbox Arcade, the Android Store. Um, and again, with the Unity Engine, it makes it really easy to get into all those markets. The big thing that studios had before in addition to money was distribution. You had to have your game in a brick and mortar store with a box on a shelf. Who owned the duplication? Studios. Who owned the distribution channels? The studios did. So you didn't have a choice. You had to go through that. Now, you don't need any of that stuff. Apple takes your 30%, but you can go straight to the Apple store and put your product up there. So that's the big shift in the industry now. It's back to, you know, when the game industry started, it was guys making games in their garages. Um, Blizzard was started by three guys who graduated from college and wanted to make games, and they worked out of their garage. Um, and the industry has gone all the way around. It's not going to be that way forever. It'll come for a cycle again in 20 years. Everybody will get big and everybody will combine and we'll have a new EA and a new Activision and you know, we'll be back, back where we were. But this is a great time because you can do that. Um, let me make sure I didn't skip anything on there. Um, so, uh, one example, you know, Asian publishers are way out in front of American publishers because in Asia, this free to play model, that's where it started. And they're used to much smaller games and smaller budgets. And so an example, um, a good friend of mine is one of the guys at um, uh, uh, Perfect World, they're a China company. Um, anybody play Torchlight? Torchlight? I know of it, but I never played it. It's a Diablo, basically it's a Diablo game. It's the guys that made Diablo. They left Blizzard and they did some other things and then they regrouped and they made this uh, basically a small Diablo. And um, before they beat the Blizzard to the punch with Diablo 3. And um, digital distribution only, no store presence. And um, the budget for that was $10 million, and 12 guys made it. And they're doing great. And then, and uh, Perfect World funded them, and then they bought them, and everybody's happy. Um, so these little deals are happening all the time. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it really is an exciting time if you're up for that sort of challenge. Um, so that brings to, now you're all wondering, when he's going to shut up and talk about how to get a job. <laughs> I can't tell you how to get a job. It's, it's not a linear path. Um, everybody has to find their own path. Uh, it's a little more linear than it used to be, like in, especially in my day, but 
It's still not. My wife's a physician. That's the most linear path ever. When, when she was in med school, we met before med school, she was in med school and I was, you know, coming home at night and working on these really boring CG projects because, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I used to say, you're so lucky because you want to do this thing that you just, you just have to do these steps and then you're there. It's not easy, but if you want to be a doctor, you go to college, you get a degree in the sciences, then you take a test, and then you go to med school, you take lots of tests, and then you graduate from med school and you do a residency in whatever it is that you want to specialize in. And then when you're out, you're a doctor and you get hired. Like nobody goes through all that and says, I just can't find a job because everybody hires doctors. So it's completely linear. It's not easy at all, but that doesn't work that way. So big change in the, in the industry. Now there's more jobs in the game industry than ever before. There's more people that want those jobs than ever before. Because gaming has become so mainstream, it's this legitimate form of entertainment now. Everybody wants to get involved. Everybody's a game fan. Everybody's into it. It's a legitimate way. It's a legitimate career. But it's, it's still hard. So, like, you know, you go to this program here, and um, uh, you're gonna, you guys are eventually going to graduate, and you have your degree. Everybody else is, too. So like, you know, just having this doesn't get you a job. If you think you're going to go to college and get this piece of paper and show up to Blizzard and say, hey, I got my diploma, I'm ready to work. No. Um, it's still talent driven. You've got to have the talent. Talent, there's, we used to say, like, talent trumps all. And it's true. Um, but what's really important is you have to want to do this. You can't. This is the way to think about your college career and you're majoring in this. This is your first job in the game industry. This is it. What do people do in their first jobs? The people that succeed when they get somewhere in their first job are the people that work harder than everybody else. The guy, they're the people that, they're the first people there at work, they're the last ones to leave. They answer questions before you ask them. That's it. Those are the people that excel and those are the people that move forward in a company. And that's in your first job, which is now, that's what you need to be doing. When I am recruiting and I'm building a team and people come up and they hand me their resume and they're right out of school, I really don't care where they went to school. I mean, there are a couple of programs that kind of a little prestige, but no, nope, it doesn't matter. What matters is what did you do at school? When you have a portfolio and you show it to someone, they would go through with me and say, yeah, this was this assignment, and this was this assignment, and this assignment, and then I'd say, okay, what did you do outside of school? And the people who spent their college years getting their degree and treated it like a nine to five job, where they showed up at nine o'clock, they took the hour lunch, and they went home at five, and they didn't think about it anymore. If you think of the people, all your contemporaries who are out trying to enter the game industry, Everybody's standing there holding this. How, how do you rise above that? Well, the people who spend every waking moment, just like I did when I was trying to figure out 3D Studio, doing things outside of class, those are the people that excel. Those are the people who get hired. Because if there's anything else other than talent that the industry looks at as passion, if you look at job descriptions, it almost always says passion for games or passion for gaming. And it's real. They want people who want to do this, who would do it if they didn't get paid to do it. Um, and, and to think that you can go to college and just get a degree, like a history degree, and then get a job in the game industry, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. it, this is a great environment to build off of and spend your time here. You're, you're already, you're, you're in an environment where everybody wants to do the same thing. And everything I said before about making projects, there's no reason why you guys can't make projects on the side. That's who gets jobs. Anything you can do to make yourself more attractive than the average person graduated from college with this piece of paper, that's what you do. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is my contemporaries, the people that are my age in the industry, that are running the studios or overseeing the people that are hiring people, we're all self-taught. You couldn't go to school. You had to figure this out on your own. So we look for people who have that kind of drive. 
not for people who just go to school, tell me what to do, give me the piece of paper, I'll go find a job. It's not going to cut it. And it's the same across all the disciplines, with the exception of computer science, that's its own separate path into the industry. So on the creative side of things, that's how it works. They want to see what you're going to bring. And if you are so passionate about this industry and passionate about the work that you're doing, you'll do it 24-7. And that's what people want to see. That's what the game industry wants to see. And that's who gets jobs. So what are some things that you can work on other than making your portfolio absolutely the best ever and filled with stuff that's not work assignments? Um, here's some, okay, I asked about LinkedIn because LinkedIn is an amazing tool for networking online. You'd be surprised, you can search for anybody on LinkedIn, you'd be surprised how many people in the industry that are really experienced will connect to you. They'll add you as a connection. Um, some people will add you as a connection. <laughs> and, but even, uh, you know, like, there's a, new, there's a feed that shows up for people that are in your circle and people that aren't in your circle. And it may say, you know, Harley Huggins is now connected to Gabe Newell. And people go, oh, I should connect to that guy. And that's how you build connections. And then when you go to shows, when you go to the GDC, and you're connected to these people on LinkedIn, you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm going to be at this show. Can I talk to you? And you'd be surprised how many people will say, sure if they have the time to do it. The other thing that's good for is, you go on an interview, you get an interview, a lot of times they'll tell you, here's the people you're meeting with. Um, or you can ask, they won't always tell you. But if they give you names, look them up on LinkedIn. Where have they worked before? What are their interests? Sometimes they'll say what the favorite games are on there. Are they the same game as you? I mean, it's, these are all things that can really sell yourself in an interview when you show up and you've done research. Nothing would turn me off more when I was at a show during recruiting than some, you know, somebody would come up to the booth and they're looking at the sign and they're just doing a shotgun approach. They're showing up, they're going up to every table and they're handing resumes out. Well, as the person hiring, I don't want that. I want them to want to work at my company. Do they even look up Red 5 Studios? Do they even look up 38 Studios? I mean, and a lot of times it's no, they'd show up, they hand me a piece of paper, go, so what do you guys do? <coughs> you're, you're going in this pile. I mean, if you can't do the legwork to even look at who you're applying to, then you're not for me. Um, be selective. When you go to shows and you're looking for jobs, research the companies. Be able to talk to them. Does everybody here play games? <laughs> I mean, I, it's a legitimate question because I get a lot of people who would come up and want to apply, and I ask, hey, we have a conversation, and I say, what kind of games do you play? Well, I don't really play games. Oh, wait, what are you doing then? <laughs> Why are you this is what you're going to do. So, and I understand you're in school, and it's finals, and it's projects, and you don't have time, and that's okay. And I would say, well, what's the last game you played? Well, I used to play a lot of Nintendo. No, that was years ago. You, you have to be able to speak this language when you go out to, to meet people in the industry. You should be reading the gaming news every day. What's going on in the industry? When I said who's John Riccatello, everybody should know who John Riccatello is. You should know that. Who's the president of NBA? Who's the president of Activision? Who's Bobby Kotick? He's the president of Activision, right? I mean, you should know these things. Who's the president of Blizzard? Mike Moran, you, you should know these things. It's, imp it's really important because it shows that you want, you, you're interested in this industry. It is part of your life. That's what separates you from all the other people walking around with this piece of paper, this diploma. It's another thing. Facebook. Good points and bad points. You've got anything on Facebook that you wouldn't want your parents to see shouldn't have it there because I'm telling you, employers will look for it. <laughs> they will. I used to do it all the time. I've got a number of guys or women that I'm trying to hire. I need to, I need, I'm not going to bring 20 people into the studio interview. I need to start paring it down. And 
maybe I'm going to do phone interviews, so uh, let's me take a hard look at these people. And I go through, and I'm looking at their work, and I'm comparing it. Well, let's see if they have any online presence, and I search for their name. You'd be amazed the kind of stuff people have out there. It will come back to you. You have to be aware of that. Um, there was one guy once who applied to uh, 38, and everything looked great. And I was trying to get down how many people I wanted to fly in to, to interview. And um, uh, so I do a search, and I find his Facebook profile. There's some stuff on there, but nothing too bad. But then he's got a link to his blog. I find his blog. Oh, he's got a blog. He does game reviews. OK. These game reviews for these horrible, vile, racist, homophobic, violent diatribes against games he didn't like, and he specifically named the people that he didn't like. And I'm sure it was fun to write that, but after I read it, I went in that pile. I'm going to talk to that guy. Someone else, uh, while we were interviewing them, was updating their Facebook page. Wow. We were watching it. And he was updating it while we were interviewing him. And so we laughed about that. And then he was still being considered. And then we were taking some time to figure out who to bring in. And, but we were keeping an eye on his, on his Facebook feed. And he, uh, he puts, you know, waiting, waiting, for, waiting for a call to interview, still waiting for a call to interview, still waiting on those assholes to call me. And then it was, and then it was, uh, if they don't call me in the next day, they can F off. And then it was, they're probably scared to hire me because I will go into that company and own those bitches. <laughs> well, you're going in that pile too. So, and it's, but it's serious. People look at that. You know, it's a big risk to hire somebody into a game company. It really is. Um, Typically, it involves relocation and moving them and all of that. And um, so you, everybody's careful about who they're hiring. So you've got to think about that. Um, now, odds are, it, you know, I'm not going to tell you it's an easy path. It may it take a lot of work to get a job. Many companies will not hire people right out of school. Um, they want experience. And, but like I said, now you can create your own experience. It was impossible to do that before. So on the one hand, the industry is in a lot of turmoil. But on the other hand, there's never been a better time to be independent and make independent games. If you do it for a while and you don't like it, if any of your games hit, so what? You just had more experience than people who are three years in the industry. Because you've shipped multiple titles. Most people that are in the industry for a couple of years haven't shipped any yet. So that's what I got. I'm happy to take questions of any kind, unless they're too personal. <laughs> yeah. Like, particularly with working with Blizzard, what would you think was your favorite work along with everything at, you've done? At Blizzard? Yes. You know, it's kind of hard to say, because when I look at it, I think about what we were doing, and you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and so I have fondness for StarCraft, just because it was like uh, the most independent filmmaking imaginable. There was only five of us, and we were working 24 hours a day, nonstop, to make that stuff. And uh, there were no rules. Nobody told us what to do for cinematics. Nobody at Blizzard said what we had to do. We just made it all up. And um, pretty much the same thing all the way up through uh, around Warcraft 3, we started to get a little more direction as to how to integrate it into the story. But we used to basically uh, in influence the storyline of the games by what we did with the cinematics. So probably, probably StarCraft just because there's just so many good memories out of um, that was just such a creative time. Yeah. Um, how important is it to be like in the game industry to like specialize in a certain like aspect of the game, like animation and sound and that kind of stuff? Uh, it's important. Um, if, if that's the path you want to take, if you're looking to get a, 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 an art job in the game industry, um, then you, yeah, you need to be able to specialize. And anything you can do in addition to that game, but you should have a specialty. If your specialty is animation, then focus on that. If you're a great animator, but you also can do rigging, 
and you understand it, that's a bonus. Um, it's good to understand the whole process and understand all the jobs, but you, you, you want to have one thing that you excel at. Yeah. Is uh, 38 Studio still a bit of a sore spot? What? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes and no. Um, there was just a big, I mean, I don't the media just won't let it die. There was just a big article in the New York Times over the weekend. And whenever that happens, everybody thinks, I don't know why my friends think I wouldn't see that, but they all email me. And I get, like, over the course of three or four days, I get, hey, I don't know if you saw this. Like, of course I saw it. Um, so, you know. Uh, and then usually when there's an article going to come out, they try and contact everybody. And I get contacted by reporters, and I have nothing to say. I don't care. Um, so, not really. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm past it now. Um, I can tell you that the article that was in the New York Times was really good. It's probably the only article so far that was written that got most of it right and was fair handed about it. Um, when it comes to a studio like that, um, is there anything to look out for when we're looking at uh, companies yep. to make sure that we do Absolutely. And that's why you need to do research and you need to keep up on what's going on in the gaming news. You know, are companies having trouble with funding? Have they been working on a game? that was supposed to come out five years ago and they're still working on it. Not a good sign. Um, it's okay to ask in an interview, where do you get your funding from? That's okay to ask. They may not, may not like it, but it, you should ask those kinds of questions. There are plenty of companies that will hire you and tell you everything's great, knowing that they don't have enough money to keep that staff after the game ships and they'll dump you after the game ships. So, you, you know, again, that's where LinkedIn comes in. Connect to people on LinkedIn. Ask, don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask them, what's it like to work at X? What's it like to work at this company? You'll be surprised how many people respond and tell you. But, you know, you gotta work at it. But you can find that stuff out. Do you think there's any new uh, software that's just come out that people should get into that, like, is really important? Um, you know, funny things happen on the 3D side of things in that because the government doesn't understand this, they allowed Autodesk to basically own everything. Wow. So uh, <laughs> Autodesk owns Maya, Softimize, and, and 3D Max. So and Softimize is pretty much dead now. Um, so, you know, the, the software, this is the thing about tools. I mean, if you have aptitude for it, um, you know, back in the older day, there was LightWave and there was... Max, and then there was Softimage, or there was Maya, I mean, I'm sorry, and like there would practically be you know, like alley fights over who was the better software, it was stupid. Because as an employer, I didn't care what you know. As long as you know one of them, converting the other one's not a big deal. If you have aptitude for it and you understand it, then if, if you have used Maya for 10 years, but I use Max in my studio, I'll switch you over, it's not hard. Um, I think, an important thing now is to understand the Unity engine and to understand the iOS and how you take a build in Unity to iOS and to understand some of the tools that are, that are in Unity. Um, that's, that's invaluable. Do you think social networking has impacted the gaming industry? And if so, is it good or bad? Well, these days social networking is like a buzzword and it can mean a million different things. What specifically do you mean by social networking in what aspect? World of Warcraft and all of those yep. Well, you know. Uh, it goes either way. Yeah. No, it's a huge component. I mean, one of the things that, like, my friend at Perfect World, he's looking for projects that incorporate social networking and a free-to-play model. Um, so it's it's almost um, it's it's almost a, a prerequisite for for games in some ways, and the and the publishers are trying to figure out how to incorporate social networking into, into their games. Um, most of it happened by accident, but it's here to stay now. So it's had it completely changed the game industry. When you were working on cinematics at Blizzard, um, you said that you were influencing the storyline based on your vision of the cinematics. Is that the um, standard for the industry? Or no, the absolutely not. No, no. And in fact, you know, Blizzard's probably they're probably one of the last companies that has their own cinematics department. I mean, pre-rendered CG cinematics are kind of, you know, nobody's, not, nobody's doing them anymore, really. They just got too expensive. 
and Blizzard. The reason Blizzard did it for so long is we were able to keep the, the department small and we all worked our asses off, so it was cheap for them. Um, and uh, when I left Blizzard in 2006, the cinematics division was 29 people. And um, then they got drunk on WoW money and <laughs> when WoW hit the next year, and they went insane, and the cinematics department is like 170 people now. It's the biggest division of Blizzard. And now, just like a big binge, Blizzard's waking up going, wow, oh, what did we do? <laughs> <laughs> and they're trying to figure out what to do with 170 people in the cinematics department. I mean, they, they, don't, know, they don't know what to do. So, so cinematics, you know, now cinematics are real time. Um, and Blizzard started that division too, but the pre-rendered stuff, it's not really, it's not viable anymore. Um, that's why, you know, for cinematics, I say, again, it's understand an engine, understand how to get, you know, assets into an engine and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, cinematics are kind of not, you know, back in that day, Blizzard was small. It was kind of the Wild West. And, you know, it was, Blizzard was a small company, and it was, it was really, there was so much collaboration going on. It really was an awesome place. It, it's not any, Blizzard's still a great place, but it's just a different place. Blizzard's... You know, they're somewhat corporate now. They have like 4,000 people worldwide. Um, you know, the office that I worked at in, in um, Irvine, you know, it used to be 30 people. Now they have their own campus with big iron gates, and it's really ridiculous. And they have like 700 people at that location, so it's very different. Yeah? What was your first biggest work that you, I'm sorry, what was your first biggest production you've ever worked on in your entire career? Game-wise? Uh, you know, I think for me, like a big turning point uh, was Diablo 2 because we had we had really been sh just flying by the seat of our pants for all the cinematics we did prior to that. And for Diablo 2, we knew we had to get organized, and um, mm. it was a big undertaking. We did we ended up not using some of the cinematics, but we created we did almost 30 minutes of CG for Diablo 2, and we only had I think 17 people. Um, and we were doing things that, I mean, we did, we did cloth, we did all sorts of stuff that ILM was just starting to play with. We were, we were really proud of that. Um, it all looks dated now, but, you know, it is dated. Um, but we had to get really organized. I mean, I had to come up with production pipeline and procedures and how to track shots and how to hand out jobs and how to track all that. And um, that's the only way we pulled that off. So I, that's probably, that was probably the big one. You talked. Uh, you started talking about like the mobile platform as a market and yep. stuff like that. And within that, I was just wondering, in your opinion, you know, there's kind of two routes a lot of developers take: they either release a small but complete game and push it out for maybe like four or five dollars, or they throw in a free-to-play model, but you have all these like microtransactions along the way. You know, oh, you need an extra ten coins. Yep. Pay ten dollars. And just what do you think is like the more feasible? Uh, the form? second one, and that's what because that's what that's what the industry is looking at. So if you want to get noticed, and also if you hit it, you know, it's a stream, it's, a, it's an income stream. So, um, you know, I, I, that's the route I would go. I would figure out a mechanic around that that is addictive. And um, that's, that's, that's going to be a big plus. Yeah? Uh, this may seem like a less professional question, but... Is it, is I'm it, married, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, how do you feel that uh, when you as you grow up, like you grew up in sort of the retro age of gaming, and now you're seeing a lot of gaming return back to the age? How does it sort of feel to be in that sort of generation? It's cool. It's it's absolutely inspiring, and it's very cool. Um, I ha have no idea whether I'm going to jump back in or not, but I think it's I it's I it's I think it's a really exciting time. Um, that having worked for really big companies, um, and I have no interest in working for big companies anymore, um, I just think it's, you know, I think it's an amazing time to, to do that. And it's not, the window's not going to be open forever. Um, it's, it'll, things are going to change. The, the industry's always morphing into something new, but, but it's an, I think it's an amazing time to want to do that. We have time for one more question. Let's see, who didn't get to ask anything? Yeah, has a question. Yeah, make it a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the game industry, 
industry, I've seen a lot of companies use and reuse uh, work that they've made. And then you mentioned you spent like four to five years on cinematics that didn't um, ever see light. So have you been able to get anything out of that or is that owned by Blizzard and they kind of locked it away? Well, I have it, but you know, I, it's, it, they own it. So I mean, I have all the assets and everything. Blizzard's, you know, I have a great relationship with Blizzard and everybody there, and they're really cool, and they gave me everything, all my work. Um, but I, you know, I really can't do anything with it. Um, they they use they use some of the stuff from the old cinematics, but um, mostly it's the the story that that uh, Chris and I worked on for a long time. Most of that's intact. Um, but they, you know, they got so over the top with those cinematics. It's um, if I told you how much they spent on just the cinematics alone for Diablo three, it's my throw up. It's just ridiculous. So, so. Oh, I've seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen. All right. Well, thank you so much for. Sure.